And just to check that that is visible now, Ethan? Yep, it looks great. Perfect, thank you. Um, so uh, as Ethan mentioned, I am the uh, native plant gardener. I work at the UW um, Arboretum in Madison. And, um, I, and I'm glad to uh, share some information with you this morning. Um, so I'll talk about bumblebee conservation in your backyard, but there are nothing's, everything's always connected. So when I talk about bumblebee conservation, it's going to connect to conservation of other creatures or uh, connections with other creatures. And uh, some of the activities that you do while participating in bumblebee conservation in your backyard, even a place as well known and as maybe maybe small or big as depending on how we think about it, but even a place as local as your backyard uh, can really lead to more and more things um, that build on this idea and that share this idea with others. So um, let's go ahead with the slides. Uh, so I'm gonna bring two threads together just to tell you kind of where I'm where I started with this um, with this work. I'm not an entomologist by training. So uh, I am a botanist by training, a science educator by training, but uh, I, I became the gardener at the Arboretum about uh, 18, 19 years ago now when the garden was just starting. So we were putting in gardens that represent the native plant communities of Southern Wisconsin. This garden is designed by Daryl Morrison. And I was just telling uh, Ethan and Tim and uh, Maggie, that uh, we that this designer, it, it, although he started this project 20 years ago uh, as a full design, he is still involved in the project so much to the point that he and I yesterday were starting uh, just laying out and planting a new garden area in this garden. Um, so it's pretty exciting to be involved in this project. So my main point being that when you put in a native plant garden where before you just had lawn or uh, landscaping more traditional landscaping, or in our case, it was a construction zone, um, you create pollinator habitat. And at first we weren't really thinking about pollinators or weren't focused on pollinators um, per se. That came kind of about 10 years in when the general interest in the population and outreach opportunities came up about talking about pollinators. And then shortly, this is just one of our gardens here that you can see uh, we're almost to this time of year uh, right now uh, in the garden. If you were visiting today, you'd see a lot of Monarda in bloom. You'd see the uh, Culver's root starting to bloom. Uh, we're still waiting on the blazing star, but, um, and the sweet black eyed Susan is just about to pop. So. So this is pretty close to what you would see here in, um, in early July. Uh, when we really took off with being interested in bumblebees and focusing on bumblebees was in 2010, when a rare bumblebee was discovered at the Arboretum, not by us, uh, and it began a whole new project for us. Um, I'm not gonna trace all the developments of that project, but needless to say, it led us into being partners with the Wisconsin DNR as, as they and you know we were able to help with the development of Bumblebee Brigade and uh, working on that. Um, it helped us work with the Fish and Wildlife Service as a, we're a well-known site now for Rusty Patch Bumblebee. And it's helped with many, many opportunities to share about this bee and about bumblebees in general and about pollinators in general. Uh, with broader audiences, including some of the people that um, are doing just great work now in the Milwaukee area, um, documenting Rusty Patch and documenting other bumblebees and managing lands and managing gardens in that area to uh, promote pollinators. So when this bee was discovered at the Arboretum, this was totally a fluke, fluke chance thing. Um, a gentleman named Gary Zamzo from UC Davis was visiting He's just on his own visiting at the Arboretum and he took this picture, one picture. Um, he took a lot of pictures, but he sent this one. And he said, and, he's, and he just emailed it and said, hey, have you seen any more of these bumblebees? It's been lost over most of its range. It's very rare. I took this picture outside your visitor center. Um, you know, How many are you seeing or have you seen any more? And we had no answer. So this, this 
single picture, just a single thing started this whole project. And we were curious right away at the beginning, which bumblebee species are present? How can we find that out? Which ones are present at the Arboretum? Which ones are present more broadly in the region? Um, and which plant species are they using? We could tell from this picture that's on a, a mountain mint. So we knew the time of year and where it was found. Um, but what plant species are visited by all those bumblebee species? If How many are there and, and how many plants are they using? And then of course, from the outreach point of view, how can we promote pollinator conservation education? That's kind of closing the loop and bringing, in, and bringing all of us together in a common goal. Uh, so today I wanna to talk about a little bit about the bumblebee life cycle and habitat. I know you've heard some of this before, but I'll just reinforce that a bit. I wanna emphasize, I've got a series of slides that talk really about gardening practices that support bumblebees. They would also help support other pollinators in some cases. Some are more specific to the bumblebee life cycle. So you'll see what I mean. Um, how to monitor rare and common bumblebees with photography and learn their IDs. So there are resources for this and I won't go into a whole clinic on bumblebee identification today, but we will, I will point out some important um, characteristics of rusty patch in comparison to other uh, species that it can be easily um, confused with. And then just to emphasize bumblebee brigade, which I know Ethan has uh, emphasized already and um, how to learn more yourself and how to share more with others what you're finding. And by sharing, we are building, collectively, we're building a large amount of um, information about the distribution of all of our bumblebees in Wisconsin, about the timing of their uh, emergence and the males emerging, the uh, new queens emerging, etc. So this is all important information. And the way that it becomes more and more useful is by amassing more and more data from all over the state and from all over um, each individual region as well. And then while you're doing this, you end up in these connections, you'll end up with other pictures of other, of other organisms and other questions. And maybe there'll be a photograph somewhere in all your photographs that causes you to take a a new direction in your uh, interest and in your in the work that you do in the future. So just an overview of Wisconsin's bee diversity. Uh, you've probably seen pie charts or diagrams like this before. This is these squares represent. Uh, this is only 400 on the grid. Let's imagine it's 500 because there are 400 to 500 Wisconsin native bee species. So bees that are native to Wisconsin. Some of them are tiny little bees, tiny little specialists. Others are giant um, black and gold bumblebee. Uh, so all the bees that are native to Wisconsin are represented by this chart. And most of them, all the ones in this unshaded area here are solitary bee species. So those are the ones that you're less likely to maybe know about, but you've probably seen some of them, the bright green, uh, sweat bees, um, other bees are all um, these solitary bee species, and I'll touch on them a little bit later. Then 15%, this corner up here, are social or semi-social bees. So these are bees that have varying amounts of social activity, so that colony structure or loose colony structure. And up in the corner here, we have 20 bumblebee species native to Wisconsin. So in Southern Wisconsin, usually 12 to 14. So I've just kind of represented that with a deeper shading. Um, and then just to point out, you had, you've heard about honeybees. They are not included in this group. The honeybees are one single species and they are uh, not native to uh, North America. The honeybees that we are normally uh, seeing in in North America are European honeybees. There's one species, they are social and they are a perennial colony. So they, their colonies build up to huge tens of thousands of bees because they're going from year to year. And the honey that they make is to maintain the colony from you know, over the winter and from year to year. So these bees up here, all these bees have more of an annual or even part of, I mean, they have an annual cycle, but you'd only see them out maybe for part of the year. Some of them is few, 
as, as little as just a few weeks of time that you'd be seeing them. Focusing on the bumblebees, the bumblebee life cycle is this annual cycle. And if we look right now, if you're going out in the backyard just after um, this talk, you're most likely at this point of the year to see the female workers. So I'm going to start there. The colonies have started, they're established. The queen that established that colony or founded the colony is in the colony, usually at this point, and she is laying eggs and raising those workers. Um, we are with some of our species at the point now where males are already being seen. So that means that we're in a point where the colonies are starting to produce the reproductive bees for next year already, the ones that will lead to the, to the colony for next year. So this colony is only going to, it's, at, it's coming into its peak now and she's produced the female workers and they've been out foraging, bringing pollen back to the nest and the pollen is used as the primary source of nutrition for the larvae as they're growing up. Um, as this colony has built up since the spring, it's now they'll, it'll now be going into the reproduction phase. And the reproduction phase is when this, this queen begins to lay eggs that become males. So the unfertilized, she can lay unfertilized eggs and those become the males. And the males go out of the nest and will be looking for mates. And she also produces females that will become future queens. So they're larger, um, they have had more nutrition within the nest or different type of nutrition. Uh, and so they're larger and they are the bees that are going to be mating. And then each one of them will survive the winter by digging underground in like late summer, early fall, digging underground and, um, and hibernating one by one. So she's the only connection between this year and next year in terms of making it through the winter. All the other bees for the colony of this year, the males, the, the original queen and the workers will, will have died by the time she's overwintering. And then in the spring, early spring, usually in mid-April for our region, although this can vary quite a bit, uh, she will emerge and forage. And for about a month, she's responsible for establishing that new colony and raising the first group of female workers to get back to the, you know, to the built up colony for next year. So that's the life cycle. And it's good to be thinking about the life cycle a little bit to interpret what you're seeing. So if we go out in the field today, we're most likely to see female workers. They'll be probably carrying pollen back to the nest. We might see some males. We've been seeing males actually quite early this year, especially for the earliest of species. Um, and we might see some future queens of that species. So the two spotted bumblebee, we've seen males and queens already. We've seen males of black and gold, um, other species. So um, the reproduction is, is underway really for 2021. Here's what I recommend for you to do if you want to get interest, if you want to get involved with bumblebees or some of us say sucked in, um, you, is to just use photography. Photography not only gives you a record of what you're seeing and a good um, documentation of what you're seeing, and it's going to be your way of participating in the larger picture of Bumblebee Brigade or other, um, other identification projects and, and documentation projects, but it's also a really great way for you to get to know bees because you're going to be following them, focusing on them, learning how, what they're gonna do next, wh where will they go on a flower and that kind of thing. So it's kind of a tool for you to get to know the bees better. And it helps you if you've got a long lens or if you can get close like this photographer here, um, you can actually see more details on the wing. And of course your photos will capture details that you won't even see when you're looking at the bees. Um, so you can submit to uh, iNaturalist, of course. Um, that's a common tool for doing our kind of quick surveys or you know backyard surveys. Um, but we also have a Bumblebee Brigade, which is the more um, is more involved 
a community science project with the DNR, and this is the link to it. But um, you, if you just look up Bumblebee Brigade, it'll come right. You'll come right to it. Uh, what can you find out from photography besides the identification? You're going to find out things about behavior. Here you can find out that Rusty Patch is an expert at uh, nectar robbing. Here it is poking its tongue right through the tube of Monarda in order to uh, get the nectar directly instead of coming through the tube as most of the bumblebees will. You may get a record of the um, future queen. Here's a beautiful, um, a beautiful new fresh um, what, what is called a gine before she's actually set up a colony, she's called a gine. So this is in the fall on a goldenrod and she's just feeding a little, she's made it already, hopefully, and just about to go into hibernation. You may find out uh, records of when they're emerging in the spring because you're always looking for them uh, early on. And you may learn a lot about floral use and partitioning. Do they all use the same flowers or do they kind of special, are there some that specialize more in certain types of flowers? So those are all questions that you can uh, approach with this uh, photography. I'm just gonna give you a few snapshot pictures here. Um, we have 12 bumblebee, bumblebees documented at the Arboretum, um, most definitely documented. Some are common. So we have the most common ones here, uh, common Eastern. This is the two spotted. Uh, really easy to see, uh, especially this year. So if you're looking for the two spots, there are these two yellow spots usually on that second segment of the bee. So just look, glance, and you can usually see that if they're coming to or leaving a flower. And the brown belted, which has a brown rusty, uh, a rusty patch, but uh, bordered with black um, here on the bee. And then some are little, uh, they're also fairly common. Um, and depending on exactly where you are, they might be very or less common, but uh, this is sort of the middle group. Uh, the red belted bumblebee is pretty, can be pretty common. Uh, it's got a lot of red uh, segments usually, but it doesn't have to. It has a tremendous amount of variation. So probably our most variable bee. And um, so that, but there it is. It loves the yellow flowers and the orange, uh, orange flowers. Um, and here is the half black bumblebee, uh, another uh, kind of rather small bee. Um, and that one can be found in a lot of habitats, but I usually generally find these in more common out in the more uh, rural area, a wooded area. Um, that's just my own personal impression of where I've, where I've found them the most. And here's the big black and gold bumblebee on the Monarda. So you can see how the size of that, that is not even a queen. And then the rarer bumblebees that we've had at the Arboretum, this is the, um, yellow banded bumblebee, it's a queen. This was really an unusual sighting. Uh, one of my students took this picture and this was a queen in the spring. Uh, she's collecting pollen. So this is pretty exciting because we're, we're on the, Madison's a very Southern southern edge of the range of, of uh, yellow banded. We've never knowingly seen a yellow banded. So we may need to look into some of our photos a little more carefully to pick this out. We weren't expecting to see it. Um, until this picture is just a, a very clear idea of it. Here's the rusty patch. So here's that rusty patch on the second segment of the abdomen with a little yellow border to the back of the bee on that segment. So that's what you're looking for, for the females, the workers and the males of rusty patch. And then here's the beautiful yellow um, bumblebee. This is one of the, species that's considered, it's a special concern species in Wisconsin, considered to be in decline possibly. So we keep an eye out for them, beautiful yellow segments all the way down. So here's close up to the rusty patch and this sort of shows you the seasonal, um, the seasonal progression for them. Here's the queen, spring queen, and this is early in May. So uh, I needed a picture that showed her uh, this part of the bee right here, this little segment of the bee is called the vertex. And if that's black, and she has two uh, solid yellow bands here, that's the rusty patch. So I this is a crummy picture of a bee, but it showed what I needed it to show. The other pictures, of course, were a little more, uh, they showed everything except for that part. So I wanted to, to um, show you that a photograph, you're gonna have multiple photographs of the same bee, you can pick from the photographs and see the different 
uh, features that you need. Here's the worker on a um, dwarf bush honeysuckle, nectaring, so you can tell it's a female. She's carrying the pollen. Here's the rusty patch. Um, and then here again on the lawn clover. So don't underestimate um, resources like that are almost underfoot. Um, and this is a worker uh, in the, on the lawn clover um, toward the middle of the summer, like later in the summer. Here's a male. Uh, he's doing a classic um, back off move. And I just didn't know that at the time. This was the first time I'd ever seen a male rusty patch and I had it on my finger. Um, for the, someone took the picture. So it, when they, when bees are, when bumblebees feel threatened, they'll put up their middle leg like that toward you. And if you just back off, then they'll lower it down. Um, so now I know that and I don't um, pick them up. But of course, bum, male bumblebees can't sting. So I wasn't about to get stung. He just, the only way he had to tell me to back off was to um, point, it, point it out like that. Um, this is the summer, a summer gyne. So it can, they can come out as early as in August or even the very end of July. Um, and there's that black vertex. There's those two yellow bands. You don't necessarily see any rusty patch on this, on this bee. Um, and here's that fall one again. So again, it's easy to be, become uh, confused with bumblebee patterns, especially if you're just looking at them on the plants, kind of getting a glimpse, but not really a good picture. This picture just shows very clearly what you're going to see. The thorax markings can be a more of a spot or it can have this kind of point uh, sticking down here on Rusty Patch. Uh, this is a female. She's on St. John's wort. And you can see a little bit of pollen being built up here on the corbicula. So she's collecting pollen all over those stamens and, and gathering it and putting it on the corbicula. Then when that's full, she'll come back to the colony and drop it off and go back out and do this again. Really good picture of that second segment with the rusty patch bordered by yellow to the back of the bee. Here's the worker. Uh, we always like to get, if we're gonna take multiple pictures of the bee to either one of these would be definitive, but having both of them, you can see the back view, you can see the side view of the bee. And um, so those can both be helpful. If you're looking for the shape of the face, you could only see it on this one. If you were looking for the pattern on the back, you could only see it here. And so those are, it's helpful to have more than one picture. Here's the male and the male has the same pattern with the second segment, but it does have a longer abdomen. And so the bee does generally look longer and narrower uh, than a female. And this is the leg and it has no structure there for carrying pollen because the male bees do not collect pollen and bring it and carry it back to the nest. He's on a Liatris here or Blazing Star, and he's kind of dusted with pollen. So he's not paying much attention to the pollen at all, uh, just nectaring throughout here, um, maybe eating some of the pollen, but you can see that he's not really gathering it. That's the male. And then here's the future queen on uh, Obedient Plant. So that kind of gives you an idea of the time of year, like in August. Um, and you can see the really how, how new this bee looks, how fresh this bee looks, that's another good sign of a, of a newly emerged um, future queen. Here's some species that you are, that often get confused with rusty patch if you're out and about. And you know, so when you're taking pictures, you wanna, you're probably gonna end up not just looking for rusty patch, you're gonna wanna be, oh, what's that one? What's that one? What's that one? And get a whole list of the bees that are, um, that are present where, you're, where you are. So here we have the, um, the uh, tricolor bumblebee. This one is not really in the Madison area or I've never seen it in the Madison area. I've only seen it south as far as La Crosse or Fort McCoy. So it has uh, a yellow segment, two orange segments and then another yellow segment and then the black segments. So it's really much more color within those first four segments than any of these other, well, than either of these bees or rusty patch. So it's a lot, it tends to be a larger bee, uh, depending on your region, you may never even see it, but, um, but it's, it's 
because you have yellow back here, some people think that it's the same pattern as rusty patch, but you need to be aware of which segments and how many segments are colored. Here's the brown belted, and it has a yellow segment for the first one, and then this uh, kind of rusty patch here, but bordered with black. So that second segment is basically black with a, a brown patch, and that's the brown belted. And then here's the half black bumblebee, and it's a little bit smaller bumblebee. And, the, and what you're seeing here, it looks a little bit like a colored patch, but that's really just the integument of the bee that you're kind of looking through the hairs and seeing that black surface of the bee. So don't be fooled by that. You can see this bee is kind of small and a little bit fluffy and fuzzy. Um, so there are other characteristics they can look at that can help you distinguish it. Here's the red belted bumblebee. And again, here we have multiple segments of red or it can look different than this, but uh, this is definitely not a rusty patch, although at a glance, you might, you might confuse it. So features of good bumblebee habitat are also features of generally good pollinator habitat, but since we're focused on bumblebees, we want to have diverse, abundant flowers, blooming plants from very early in the season to late in the season, like the whole span of the season. They don't store a lot of energy in their colonies, so they need to be foraging continuously throughout. Um, they need suitable nest sites. So they need places where they can find chipmunk holes or crevices, um, compost, um, leaf litter, um, cracks in the foundation, uh, places where they can find a large enough area about the size of like a softball to um, create their nest. Um, overwintering sites. So this is loose soil. It could be wooded areas. Uh, the the um, places that we the place that we found rusty patch overwintering was actually in a, one of our woods, far away from the from the flowers that it was using. You know that they were the bees were using it late in the season. Uh, north facing slope in where there was leaf litter, so she could dig her um, her hibernaculum. Um, we of course, encourage no insecticides. The systemic insecticides are the ones which are taken up within the plant tissue and they get into the nectar and they get into the pollen, into all parts of the plant, and then they are taken up by the bees. It can, uh, the bees can sometimes, they could survive maybe carrying that pollen, bringing it back to the nest. But what the impact um, is, is that uh, those insecticides end up having a uh, deleterious effect on the reproduction of the colony. So like instead of creating, instead of producing 20 new queens for the following year, the colony might only be able to produce two. And so the odds then of that colony's genetics continuing through seasons is much, much reduced. So no insecticides, if at all, uh, if possible. And I mean, in the native plant garden, which you see pictured here, we don't use any insecticides. And um, at the Arboretum, we don't really use insecticides except for a few uh, targeted things in the horticultural collection. So um, we aren't treating our ash trees. Um, and so any of those insecticides that are used for that kind of purpose, um, we don't use. And that's, uh, and the reason is, this is one of the reasons. So I'm going to go through a few plants just um, because people are always wondering what plants can I grow, what plants could span the seasons. And this is not at all, I mean, you could do, I could talk for two hours about just all the different plants, but I want to show you some particularly that bumblebees are using a lot. These are two in the early spring, the prairie smoke and the shooting star that are uh, both um, pollinated by the bees when they're upside down like this. And you can see this bee has buzz pollinated that plant. It's got some dots and uh, sprinkles of pollen here on its body. It shakes the flower and the pollen, some of the pollen falls down onto the bee. The bee can groom that and put it onto her corbicula. Look at this large pollen ball already formed here. And that's about time to head back to the colony. And then uh, our uh, savanna gardens. So even if we have some shade, some light shade, uh, the lupins either in our sand prairie or in the savanna garden, uh, our favorite of the bumblebees, especially at the queen time. So here is a um, here's a bee visiting the lupin flower, and there that's a hot spot if you have a lot of lupins 
um, that'll be a hot spot for observing the bumblebees. Also, they'll visit spiderwort. Here is spiderwort blooming in this garden. So that comes um, about the same time or a little bit later. Um, and then of course the milkweeds. And so here's the butterfly milkweed. Um, the white sage is not really a pollinator plant, but it does make a nice um, contrast for color uh, with the butterfly weed or a lot of our other, um, a lot of our other dry mesic prairie plants. And right now it's monarda season. So this is awesome uh, because you'll have areas like this that are that look like they're filled with only monarda. They really aren't, but uh, this garden is a great place right now to be going to document bumblebees because the bumblebees will come to whatever resource is going. And the monarda has been blooming, started blooming about a week ago. So now the bumblebees are switching over to it and, and gathering here. Uh, we also have a uh, pale purple coneflower, black-eyed Susan. So there, there are other, other plants in this garden. It just um, looks a little overpowering with monarda right now. <laughs> And um, to mention Monarda, it is a very, is an excellent resource for not just for bumblebees or for watching bumblebees, but also for all, for a lot of other bee groups, butterflies, beetles, wasps, etc. Some of the moths use it as a larval, it's a larval host for them. So it fits into this bigger picture of supporting life in a lot of forms. Uh, yesterday when I was out, um, I, ha I had some monarchs uh, visiting the Monarda and that's kind of interesting to watch them nectaring on Monarda. It's, it, it doesn't look easy for them. Um, but the Monarda is just starting to bloom now. So it's blooming up in the top here. Uh, those flowers are the ones that are open now. So it was a little more direct for the, for the butterflies. This is a generalist. Uh, we have generalist bees on uh, Monarda, of course. This is a two-spotted bumblebee here. Uh, going through the tubes, as I mentioned before, here's the rusty patch again, going up, uh, puncturing the tube. So that's um, nectar robbing on Monarda. And, but then we also have specialist bees that are visiting Monarda. And this one's out here right on, the, just visiting the stamen basically, collecting the pollen. And this is a tiny little bee that is a specialist on Monarda. It's only out during the Monarda um, season. And here's the white pollen that it's collecting from the Monarda and it's um, a solitary bee. So it's just reproducing. She's going to take that pollen back, provision eggs, and then they will develop over the year and um, emerge next season. Uh, your rain gardens can be an excellent place to have a pollinator resource. So here we have our, rain, our small rain garden where the Angelica was already blooming. That was that could have hosted um, earlier, bee, earlier bees and flies, especially uh, in the spring. But now at this time of year um, that this picture is taken, the uh, swamp milkweed and the, um, uh, and the bone set is blooming. And if we take a closer look at the milkweed, we, um, everyone's familiar with milkweed, of course. We have 12 native species in Wisconsin, some of them quite rare, but this one is really great for gardens and especially for rain gardens, uh, the red milkweed. And the flower structure is very specific to milkweeds and the pollination mechanism is very uh, specific. So a little tiny pollen packets are available here in the, this part of the flower, a little hook where the bee uh, um, catches its leg and pulls that little pollen packet, those little pollen packets out. And then when it visits another flower, there's a little slot there. Those pollen packets have to slide in. So it's a very, it's not, it's not a process that can be carried out by very many organisms. Um, and here's what it looks like when it's on the bee. There's little golden things dangling down here from the legs and even from the mandible. Those are pollen, a plinia from the milkweed. So I just had this picture of this bee. This is a, um, the golden northern bumblebee. Um, and you will find that in our, in our area. Um, but it was, it was visiting a uh, milk vetch, but I could tell that it was coming from a milkweed. And um, we know that for the most part, the larger bees, bumblebees, and large wasps are good pollinators of milkweed. And a lot of the other insects that visit milkweed are not uh, the flowers for nectar 
are not necessarily good pollinators. So we have this system where an organism like the monarch is utterly reliant on milkweed to lay its eggs and for the larvae to grow to mature on only milkweed. But, and it, it'll visit milkweed to get nectar, but it's not an effective pollinator of milkweed. And other butterflies are not. And uh, we do see ants sometimes with carrying, carrying the pollinia, but um, I don't know how common that is for like outcrossing um, milkweed uh, plants. But the bumblebees and wasps do a good job of it. And um, so keeping in mind the connections between these different organisms, one organism relies, is relying on another organism through this sort of indirect, um, indirect effect on the reproduction of milkweed by these um, larger pollinators. And of course, there's all the flowers um, in the system and the monarchs need they don't need just milkweed because they need lots of resources, especially toward the end of the season when they're preparing to migrate from our area down to Mexico. So they need lots of floral resources. And the same advice that I give for bumblebees about floral resource is um, applies also to all those other organisms that are relying on those seasonal resources. A couple more plants that uh, for the later in the season, the New England aster, just a powerhouse of a uh, resource, not only for rusty patch, but also for all those butterflies and other uh, late season insects. And the silky aster, which is kind of a nice small plant. I like, it's one of my favorites, so I like to include it. A uh, lot, it has fairly large flowers. The flowers are almost the size of, or they're about the same size as uh, New England aster, but um, it's a small plant. And it's like good for rock gardens and places where there's not much competition. Um, just a beautiful little plant. Bottle gentian is another bumblebee uh, pollinated plant. So these are the flowers in full bloom. And this little hole uh, here is where the bumblebee forces its way in. These are five petals that are pleated and folded and held in that position. And they never open more than this on the blue uh, bottle gentian. And the bee forces its way in the petals fold back up the way they were and the bee is inside moving about. Um, and then it comes popping out and the, and the flower is pollinated. So these darker ones here have already been pollinated. The, this one's probably right in full bloom right now. Um, and the buds further, there's a, like this is an earlier stage. So this one, uh, is good to grow if you have a rain garden, uh, if you can grow it among other plants, if you have deer, try to keep it surrounded by other plants because they do like to eat those, but it's blooming late, later in the summer in August. Um, and so it's a really great, um, a really great plant to have with, for bumblebees. So just now the practices, and these are practices I'm going to, I, I mentioned they'll be about bumblebees, but they also apply to native plant gardening in general kind of, and to other encouraging other pollinators, birds, etc. Maximize the number and diversity of native plants in your landscape. This just means get as many plants as you can, native plants as you can, and as many kinds as you can within, uh, within your area. And they, and they need to match your area. So you can see this is a garden that's pretty well shaded. This is a spring, these are this is taken in the spring. So some of these are the spring ephemerals that are important for bumblebees early in the season, but also just important for ants and other, other creatures at this time of year too. The seasonal succession of flowering is so important. Having things in bloom all the way along. And don't forget that trees may be included in this, um, trees and shrubs, um, and have varying flower forms. So uh, you want to have, uh, you know, there's flowers that are held in clusters like the Joe Pieweed here. These are the flowers that are um, of the blazing star. So they have a different structure and they're kind of arranged in a different way. They're gonna bloom from the top here and then all the way down. So it's kind of a long, a fairly long sequence right there. Um, the culver's root. This plant right here is a uh, grassleaf goldenrod. So that one blooms a little later, but you can still already see kind of a yellow tinge to the top of it. 
Uh, there were um, wild strawberries. There's wild strawberries in this bed. There's irises. And so these are all, we can see evidence of plants that bloomed earlier and evidence of plants that will come later. But we have these varied forms. And then also we have grasses. And the grasses aren't necessarily used by bumblebees or, or pollinators necessarily. But they are part of the structure. And they do uh, create, bunch grasses will create places where bumblebees might nest. So mixing up those things, not just having flowers is also, uh, can also be important. And then I can't emphasize this enough, extending the floral resources by planting native plants that bloom early in the season and late in the season. So here's the same garden, midsummer, um, and then here it is in September. So in September, we still have in this garden, the showy goldenrod, Riddell's goldenrod, and there's some, um, New England aster there, and nothing else is really blooming in the gardens at all at this point, but those three are, are still blooming. So we have that continuity going as late as possible. This is uh, just a screenshot uh, from the Fish and Wildlife Service um, website about plants for Rusty Patch. And what, it's, what it doesn't tell you is that Rusty Patch uh, plants that are suitable for rusty patch will also be excellent for many of the other bumblebees. Almost all of them will find these same plants uh, favorites. And this goes through the way this uh, one page sheet goes is uh, through spring and out to the end of the season. And it'll give you the information about the habitat to grow the plants, the amount of shade they need, the scientific name so you can look up more information if you want to. Um, so this is a great resource. It's just a one page uh, sheet and they did such a great job with the illustrations as well. So this would be something to look at and you just, if you just uh, search on Rusty Patch Bumblebee Endangered, the plant list will come, you'll see that Google right up for you. Uh, I recommend that you plant the straight species instead of the cultivars for the most part, but uh, some cultivars are valuable for pollinators. So uh, we do have some study, there are some studies being done about cultivars and how in comparing cultivars as to whether they're valuable for pollinators. Um, so if there is information about a cultivar, you could use that. Otherwise, um, observation can help. Um, you, can, you can watch or you, it, luckily I have a a place here nearby um, in Madison where we can go look at a demonstration garden. We can look at, uh, I can look at cultivars and see what, what's visiting. Um, here's a cultivar of uh, Baptisia. That's the black and gold bumblebee. And here is um, the black and gold bumblebee visiting the native um, Baptisia or one of the native Baptisias. So just because it's a cultivar and it seems like it's the same plant, it may not be the same plant for the for the pollinator. That's just the, the caution that I bring. We of course want to avoid these systemic insecticides as I mentioned before. These are plants from a native plant nursery. They're going to be proud to tell you that they're not treated with anything in production. But some plants that you might purchase uh, out you know at a just a, a store might be might have been raised while treated with the systemic insecticides. So it's, it's good to question uh, about that and to ask about it, it, or if you're getting them supplied from a place that will, you know, can, can guarantee you that they're not treated, then you, you don't have to worry about it. And that's just an important point. For bumblebees, we, uh, and probably other creatures too, but especially bumblebees, we wanna have logs, rocks, leaf litter, kind of have buffer areas um, or areas that are a little maybe rougher than a, a highly maintained or manicured garden. Um, and I recommend that you avoid using landscape fabric or rocks for mulch because the bees can't get down through that. And this would be true for some of those solitary ground nesting bees as well. Um, if you plant densely that, and especially with native plants over time, they will they will be competing underground as well as above ground with any weeds. It'll be difficult for weeds to get established. So we do have maintenance when we grow native plants for sure, um, but this is kind of the area where it could be a little bit, a little bit rougher. You just watch for invasives coming in. 
We wanna protect and document the bees nests and overwintering sites. So here's a bumblebee coming out of the ground and that doesn't look like much, but there's a hole there and that is where that bee was nesting. And here's a place where tree trunks came together on a basswood. And this right here is kind of that material that builds up in there. There's a brown belted bumblebee nest within this, uh, in this particular situation. And one of my colleagues here, I mentioned before, had discovered a over, an overwintering rusty patch bumblebee when he was doing soil coring for a completely different project. So he pulled up the core and he noticed this bee kind of fell out of the core. Uh, he took a few pictures, put it all back the way he, um, he knew that it was an overwintering bee, um, put it all back and hopefully she made it. Uh, but this turned out to be a rusty patch bumblebee, which was so unusual to be able to actually find one of those in overwintering. Um, I don't think the chances of that are very good, but he did. Um, we leave the plant material standing over the winter. So this um, not only is kind of beautiful uh, with the winter, but also for very practical reasons. Uh, you can see here in this uh, panorama that with the standing plants, uh, left in place, it kind of shows where the garden beds are. So in a public garden, this could become important or public space uh, because then people aren't just walking over everything. They know they're making their paths through uh, where there's just open you know, lawn or open pathways, um, even if they can't see those, but they can see that the garden is here um, and that just protects the plants even in the winter. And also there's a lot of insect material, not uh, bumblebees up in these plants, but there's a lot of overwintering insect material up in this plant material. And a lot of birds will be using seeds in this throughout the winter. So uh, that's those are the reasons that we leave it up. And we either trim it in the spring or in some cases, such as this rain garden right here, uh, we uh, I'm able with our crew to uh, do prescribed fire on that um, to remove the material late in the, late in the, um, winter, early spring, dormant season and burn. Documenting. We want to um, document things. I mean, that's how we're going to learn about them. Otherwise, we don't really have a sense for what we're seeing. Um, so here we upload our photos to Bumblebee Brigade. And I know you'll get a little experience with that um, perhaps later on. Hopefully, you'll, you'll see some exciting um, bees to, to practice with. Um, and this is the rusty patch, of course, endangered. For the photography, what you want to do is get multiple pictures of the same bee. So we usually just find a bee and take multiple pictures. So here's three pictures taken of this bee. And then be sure after you've taken of that individual, be sure you take a spacer photo, just the ground or something, your hand or whatever, so that you know that the next series of pictures is a different individual. Um, and then you'll have the view, you'll probably hopefully have the views like the back view, the side view, and a head view that will help you identify. And this one happens to be a lemon cuckoo bumblebee. Uh, this is a nest parasitic bumblebee. So she's a female, kind of large. And in this case, she's foraging on the uh, hoary vervain, which is in bloom now here. So if you find hoary vervain, you might, that might be a good place to do some photography. The bees have to move around all those flowers. Here are some resources for identifying your bees. Bumblebees of Eastern um, United States is available as a download. Um, Bumblebee Brigade is from the DNR. There are sheets available from um, the, the bumblebees of Illinois, Missouri, and Indiana and Ohio. Uh, that's available through Bee Spotter. Uh, Here's a book called The Bumblebees of North America that covers all the bumblebees in, the, uh, in North America, including ours. Bumblebee Watch is another, another project with a lot of good resources on site with the Xerces Society. So if you're doing bumblebee watching in a different state than Wisconsin, you can submit your photos here and have them verified and, and contribute in that way. Bug Guide is another resource that um, I'll use for, I'll mention for other insects, but um, you can send bee photos there if you're just curious about ID. But if you send to your bumblebees to Bumblebee Brigade, you'll have your IDs um, verified. There's Bumblebee Brigade in case you're needing to remember that 
um, name. And the Wisconsin bumblebees need your help. Here's 20 bumblebees showing the uh, endangered bumblebee here, the rusty patch. These are species of conservation need, the ones circled in blue. And these three down here are um, nest parasite bumblebees for which we don't have enough information to know anything really about their status. So should you see some of those and get pictures of them, that would be uh, especially um, interesting and especially meaningful. Here's the rusty, here's what happens after you get your pictures of rusty patch and you submit them. This is a 10 year map. Um, so it's showing with the red dots, that's an area around an observation, which is where the most likely area where that uh, bumblebee say its nest would be or its, its home range would be. Um, and then the yellow around that represents the land use areas around the original siting that would also be uh, somewhat suitable for them. So we're, we're not, you know, when we see a bee in a certain place, we don't, it's not just like that's the only place you'll ever see that bee. That bee is traveling in an area and then the suitable habitat around that area could be a potential zone as well. So you can zoom in on this map if you visit it on the Fish and Wildlife um, Service website and you can zoom in and look at your area um, to see where where are you relative or, or someplace you're visiting where is that relative to where others have seen the, the bee and you can see that where you have a lot of observers you have a lot of sightings Minneapolis Twin Cities area a long long history of um, of observation there Minnesota's done a whole statewide survey of bees so you can see they've found some scattered around. Wisconsin, this is the Madison area here and our prairie, our big prairie restoration areas. Um, and then of course the Milwaukee area where people have been watching and documenting now for um, quite a few years. And this is the Forest Preserve of Illinois where they've done a lot of trainings and a lot of observations. Here's the Prairie Restoration Nachusa area here. So you can see, um, you can see patterns of where people are really looking, but you can also see patterns in places where people are just picking up observations. So it'd be very interesting, like what's going on in here. Uh, that would be very interesting to know. Are we going to see any more records, you know, as we go north here? Are we going to see more records in this part of the state? So there's places either in your backyard or where you travel lots of places to, to um, help document. So we talked about these bees. I just want to revisit this for a second to remind you about those solitary bees. Some of them are ground nesters. So all the pictures that I take of bumblebees, I end up with pictures of everything else too. Um, it's just a, it's just a, a, the kind of project where it keeps on building out. So here is a ground nesting bee visiting on the um, New England aster. Here's, a, here's some ground nesting bees visiting durka, which is a spring flowering shrub, flowers before the leaves even come out. And it's an understory shrub of rich uh, woods, usually north facing. So here are some uh, ground nesting bees. There is the bee in its ground nest, solitary bees, um, going about a several week life cycle that, you know, is an annual cycle, but they're only out for several weeks in the spring in that case. Here's a small sweat bee, which is a ground nesting bee, finding it on various flowers, the um, geranium, the rose, and the phryma or lop seed. Here's um, cavity nesting bees. These are these this, these examples are the leaf cutters here, uh, cutting a leaf. She uses the leaves to um, build a little cell where she puts the pollen, lays the egg, and that's how it develops over uh, the year. She collects the pollen here on her abdomen. Here's visiting Baptisia. There's the pollen collecting. So she's collecting a pollen by herself, provisioning her eggs, and creating those leafy um, those leafy cells. Um, all by herself. And then these are two uh, wool carter bees. Those are not native bees to Wisconsin, but they're also uh, cavity nesting. And I'm sure you would have a chance to see them if you're spending much time watching bees. These are all, you can get these identifications. Um, if you see something you don't 
if you get a picture like this during your photo sessions, you don't know what it is. For butterflies, you can use wisconsinbutterflies.org, a very useful site, or bugguide.net, submit your pictures. You can, of course, always submit to um, Bumble, uh, to, I'm sorry, to uh, iNaturalist, but uh, sometimes some of these, if you really want to know the scientific name, you may need to go a little deeper. And bugguide.net has experts like around the clock um, identifying different insects. So um, very useful. Flies and beetles. Um, here's a bumblebee mimic fly. I sent that one in to bug guide and got an idea on it very quickly. Um, so in this one as well. So these are just, here's a beetle, other types of flies. Birds, of course, we have hummingbirds in Wisconsin that are pollinators. Um, there's not too much diversity on that, although we, um, I know from Jennifer, you can see, uh, you can sometimes see other species, but um, mostly you're gonna see one species of hummingbird. They do like um, plants that aren't typical um, hummingbird plants, maybe. I think this is one I know that they just love the giant purple hyssop. So uh, wasps. Uh, this is, these are, these are, they don't collect pollen from flowers, but they do nectar on flowers. Here's what they collect for their young giant insects. In this case, the golden digger wasp is grasping this Katie did. And right after I took this picture, she flew off across the prairie carrying that Katie did to uh, lay, she's going to put that underground, lay eggs, lay her egg on it, and ha that will be the food source for her developing um, larva. And here's a, a foraging on Rattlesnake Master. So this is my thank you um, slide for the staff, students, uh, my garden designer, all the volunteers that I work with uh, when we're not in a pandemic, um, and the bumblebee monitors and experts who've, um, who, who are helping people learn more about bumblebees, the DNR, and everyone promoting bumblebee conservation. So. I will stop there and if there's any questions, I'd be glad to take them.